church over the years. Uh, it's a lovely God-filled place. Uh, but I just want to encourage you guys uh, specifically, you know, when, you, when you're coming in from uh, outside and you're not in, in a group every week, you know, you, you feel what's in the room. So I want to encourage you. There's a real freedom here. Um, there's, a, there's a security, uh, you know, to have a go at something. Um, there's, there's faith that, that God is going to do things. And, and you know what Jesus said? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? There's lots of things he could have said, but will he find faith? And uh, so the Lord is certainly amongst you uh, and, and working in you and through you. And, and you're going to continue to see, you know, growth uh, and progress, whatever that looks like. Um, now, we, we've been, we, we've spoken at your church before. I can't quite remember when the last time was. It might have been the week after your last church weekend. I know we did that one time at Blackpool. And... Uh, and, and, and the leaders, whoever was there that morning, said, oh, sorry, half the people have got COVID from church weekend. <laughs> and then that happened to us as well. We did a weekend with the church up in Pedrith. Oh, sorry, we went on the weekend away and half the church had got COVID. So we've got him one week earlier so that he's still here and you're, and you're still uh, healthy at the moment. So for those who don't know us, just a, a little bit of background for us. So we both grew up in the south of England. Um, in, not in London, but sort of in the London sort of, the sort of area. Uh, we, we met down there. Um, uh, been married 36 years. <laughs> Men, hope you can remember how many years you've been married. It's important sometimes. <laughs> uh, and the Lord called us up to Bolton uh, 30, almost 30 years ago, it was, that, that, that we moved. And uh, so for us, that was like a really big move. Um, it's not like coming from Nigeria or something, but it's a big difference from the south of England to the, the north of England. And, uh, you know, we, we had no idea really what we were doing. Uh, God, God helped us along the way. Um, we had two children who were very small at the time. Uh, they're now both growing up and our son is taller than me. So we've got a daughter who lives in Bedford, who's a physio. Uh, and our son is married with a little girl, a three-year-old girl. Um, and they currently live in Frankfurt in Germany. Uh, moved over there to be part of a church plant. Um, a bit difficult to get to see them, um, but uh, they're following the call of God, so, so that's great. And just a little bit about where our church is now. So having uh, led the church for 25 years, um, in the time leading up to that, we felt it was time to sort of pass on to, uh, to somebody who was younger. So we spent a while, first of all, just Helen and I sort of praying about who that might be amongst our team. And then, uh, so five years ago, uh, we handed over to a lovely guy called Dave. Um, I know one or two who've been to leaders meetings would have, would have met him. Um, and that has gone really, really well. Like, you know, in a relay race, passing on the baton. Uh, you know, you're still running, but somebody else is, is, part, is holding the baton. And uh, that, that's gone excellently. We, we've had a very difficult year or so. Because um, Dave, who I, I handed things on to, he's, I think he's 41 now, something like that. And about 18 months ago, he got diagnosed uh, with bowel cancer. Um, and so that was like a really serious thing. Uh, so I, I, by that point, I had, uh, was just working two days a week for the church and thought, yeah, somebody else is leading this now. <sighs> Suddenly, <laughs> found myself back in that, that seat yes. again. Uh, so that, that was a really hard time in many ways, as you could imagine. But praise God, he is now 100% well and recovered. <laughs> So that, that was such an answer to prayer, and we, you know, we praise God for what the NHS did as well. Um, and uh, just quite recently, he had a six-monthly check from when his treatment finished. Cameras up in, unpleasant. Uh, blood tests, scans, nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, so that we really, really praise God for that. So I'm, I'm officially retired now, but it, you know, it just means I don't get paid for anything anymore. Right? <laughs> you know all about that. So it's really great to, uh, to, to be here. Um, just, just before I get started, this might sound a little, little bit strange, but just had a thought dropped in my head. I'm not sure if it's from the Lord or, or from me. Has anybody in recent weeks or months lost some keys? Does that mean anybody ben lost some keys? Ben has lost the church keys. <laughs> Okay, well, I think this is for your family then. Okay. So what, what I felt... The, the, this is very unusual, actually. Okay. I, I, I just felt, felt the Lord said, you know, using that illustration of, of you, know, you have never been lost. You have never been forgotten by God. 
um, that you know the, the, the keys um, you know they 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 might know where you are you, you might thought oh what, what's happening what's happening God is never lost track of where you've been and he never will do uh, he's, he's known your precise location not you know geographically but in your heart in your circumstances always known where you are and he's always um, it's been absolutely certain that he's going to meet you uh, in your point of need um, and take you forwards again. Uh, so, Lord, bless their family, Lord. We know all the, yeah. the difficulties, Lord, they, they've had and, and continue to have, Lord. Uh, Lord, let those keys be found. <laughs> but we pray more than that, Lord God. Uh, Lord, let there be confidence in your hand uh, and in your knowledge and in your, your desire to, to bless them in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good. Okay, well, we've got to this morning and uh, tomorrow morning, and uh, the, so the two topics uh, that we're looking at, which are, are linked, one very much flows into the other, uh, identity and right. presence. And it, in, when we know who we are, it is easier to more fully and deeply experience the presence of God. Uh, so, you know, if we think we're nothing, um, then we think, oh, who, who am I to experience God? But when we know we're loved, oh, yeah, of course, of course, uh, I can expect to, uh, to be able to dig deeper into God. So tomorrow we're looking at presence, and um, this morning I'm, I'm looking at identity in the face of failure. That's what I've, I've called it. So uh, anybody perfect here? Um, no, no, okay. <laughs> yeah. Right, so... But it's, this is true for all the time, but especially in the times when we don't get everything right. When we let God down, maybe we let others down, actually we feel we let ourselves down. Uh, it's saying, what is our identity? What does God say about our identity in the face of failure? So if you want to look at, uh, follow things in your Bible, I'm today looking at Exodus chapter 32. Tomorrow it'll be Exodus chapter 33. So the context of this, you'll, most of you will be very familiar with this, that Moses has been up on the mountain with God, uh, receiving the, the Ten Commandments. Uh, he was a long time up there. Uh, and while he was away, uh, despite one, one, one of the songs that we sung, one by Corey Asbury, you led me out of Egypt, I will never forget you. Well, we read this story and the people forgot very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So while Moses was away, they got into all sorts of trouble, made the golden calf, and this is what this passage uh, is talking about. So Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was, a long, was so long coming down from the mountain, they gathered round Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Then, and uh, drops, dropping down to uh, verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. They are a stiff-necked people. In other words, they're stubborn. They don't learn their lessons very well. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. And then I will make you into a great nation. So rather like with Noah, God was saying, we need to start again. Now we're going to look to see what did actually happen. But uh, I just want to talk about this, this first bit, uh, just a little bit first. They were quick to turn away, God said, from the God who had rescued them so amazingly, spectacularly, miraculously, from the hands of their Egyptian slave masters. The God who'd been providing uh, quail and manna and in the wilderness, you know, water out of the rock. You know, we, we could read that story uh, and, and say, oh, how could they do that? You know, that's, that's crazy. I'm sure if I was in that situation, I wouldn't have behaved like that. Mm, well, maybe we can fall for the same principle, perhaps less dramatically, 
Uh, you know, I've not noticed any golden calves when I've been walking around <laughs> just now. But, but, you know, think what was happening. Moses was their mouthpiece. You've not, not yet got onto the new covenant where, where every person would, would know their God and the Spirit was living inside people. Moses was really important to them. They knew about God through Moses. And, he, and he'd been gone. He'd been gone for some time. So what were they lacking? They were lacking, you, you might say, they probably felt they were lacking the presence of God. Because God was like in Moses talking to them. So, so he wasn't there. And, and Moses wasn't speaking any more words of comfort or uh, encouragement or direction. Well, can't actually we be the same? There are times when I don't feel God. Mm. And I don't understand uh, what God is doing. And it feels from my perspective, oh, God's been gone a long time. <laughs> where, where are his words? You know, we might be crying out to God for some guidance or something or a breakthrough, whatever it might be. And it feels to us like God isn't speaking and God isn't answering. And, and it can feel like God isn't there. You know, you know, what do we do in those situations? They turn to something or someone else. Actually, you know, in our own way, and it's different for, for each one of us. We could do the same things. You know, maybe, maybe we're not like uh, people outside of church who might turn to sort of drugs or illicit sex or something. But, uh, you know, we can... What, what is your advice? Maybe you start eating too much. Uh, maybe you drink a little bit too much alcohol. Maybe you can get consumed by video games just, just as, as an escapist or too much TV or social media. Maybe... A friendship that is going a, a bit too far. It, it's, it's all sorts of different things. But if we're honest, that we can so easily turn from the one true God to something else. So we've got to be very careful not to point the finger. We've got to be very realistic and know that God knows us and he understands us. And, and somebody said in one of the contributions, I'll give us your prayer, Andrew. You go, I don't always find it easy, Lord. Well, we can all put our hand up to, to that. Uh, and uh, so we, we have to see actually human nature is, is the same uh, from one generation to another. Or maybe your response like the people was, well, God doesn't seem to be doing anything. I better do something. <laughs> uh, and, you know, this reminds me of, of Genesis chapter 3, Adam, Adam and Eve, where um, the, the serpent said to them, uh, effectively, look, you, you better do something here. I, I think it's better if you take control of things. And that has been something that is in our human nature without God uh, from generation to, to generation. You know, I like to get things done. I like things organised. I like to have plans and goals. And, and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. But it can be in our lives sometimes, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to sort this out. And we can do that without God, uh, you know, forgetting that, that, yes, God wants us to learn and to work hard and to do stuff, but we're called to do everything in partnership with God and with his leading. But the most important thing that I want to say from this, you know, we could look at the people of Israel and say, yeah, they did this, they did that, they didn't do this, they didn't, didn't do that. But there was a reason why they did the wrong stuff and didn't do the right stuff. Underneath their response, underneath their decisions, underneath their actions, there was a way of thinking, a way of seeing, a way of interpreting their circumstances that led to their response. They did what they did because they perceived things in a certain way. Right? They responded as they did because they had a certain understanding of the situation, of themselves and of who God was. Now they had experienced God in amazing, dramatic, powerful ways. But we can see from how they responded here that suddenly when the pressure was on, they lacked that deeper knowledge of God's character, God's heart, God's ways. If they'd have really known God, as we see Moses did, I don't think they would have been so quick to respond as they did. And the same is true of us. We do what we do because we're thinking in a certain way. 
because we perceive ourselves and God in a certain way, and our decisions, our responses, our actions are a fruit or an overflow, that for better or for worse. And I think you could sum this up, talking about the people of God, and we can be the same, that they were acting out of an orphan spirit rather than a spirit of sonship. They felt God had abandoned them. They felt they were on their own. They felt, well, we need to get, get hold of this. So an orphan spirit feels that they need to take control of themselves, of a situation, because there's nobody else around to do it. There's, if, if you haven't got a mother or father or that, that sort of figure in your life, you are on your own. That's, that's a scary, a scary uh, place to be. And you've got to get hold of things, because nobody else is doing it. And although, theologically, we know that God is our Father, when the pressure is on, it can reveal what we really experienced or not yet experienced. And we can find ourselves uh, getting hold of stuff because we think in the wrong way. We're thinking with an orphan spirit. Nobody else to help us. So uh, we, we'd better do something. Maybe, uh, we, we haven't, maybe we interpret what's happening in the wrong way. This is exactly what the people did. So we, we, it, it's not that like when God speaks, everything just opens up. I wish it was like the Red Sea every time. Our experience is no. Often when God says something, there's a challenge in some way. Uh, and, and we can easily think, oh, no, oh maybe God isn't for me after all. And so, so we could sum up all these things so that when we, we ourselves face trials or actually when we face failure, our response in those difficult circumstances reveals our understanding of our true identity. Okay, it's already in there. It's inside us. But when pressure's on, and, and I'd say particularly when we, when we blow it sometimes, how we respond to that betrays or reveals how we perceive ourselves. Yeah. Now, we could go much further into that comparison between an orphan spirit and a spirit of sonship, but what I want to focus on, because what this passage goes on to talk about, is the antidote, the solution to an orphan spirit. Now, in verse 10, God had said to Moses, leave me alone so my anger may burn against them and I might destroy them. But actually, if you drop down to verse 14, it says, oh, the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster that, that he had threatened. So Moses must have said something pretty special because God relented. God changed his mind. And just as a little side issue, you know, sometimes when God suggests things to people in the Bible uh, or um, asks questions of people in the Bible, it's because actually he's looking for some sort of response. Yeah. Yeah. He's looking to draw something out of us. So, so just bear that in, in mind, that, that if God is asking you something, it's not because he doesn't know already. <laughs> it's because he's looking for what's in your heart. If he suggests something, actually it might be because he wants to stir you. And this is what happened with Moses. God said, I, I think I'm going to do this. And, and he was pleased when Moses said, no, Lord, no, this can't be. So what were these amazing things? That, uh, that Moses said, which caused God to relent. It must have been something quite significant, and that's what we're going to, to look at now. First of all, notice Moses uh, does not appeal to God on the lines of, oh, they're not that bad. <laughs> you know, let, let's, let's cross it over. Let's, let's pretend everything's okay. No, he doesn't do that. And another thing he doesn't do is say, yeah, well, just try harder, God. Next time, we'll do better. Please, please be lenient on us. He doesn't put that sort of argument to God. Let's see what he does do. So we're going to read out verses 11 to 14. Moses sought the favour of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? And why should the Egyptians say, Ugh, it was with evil <coughs> intent he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. 
Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I'll give your descendants all this land that I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. So you see, Moses had spent a lot of time with God up to that point, many, many years. So he hadn't just acquired knowledge in the sense of, you know, gone to university or something. He had a knowledge of who God was and what God's heart was and, and God's ways. And, and so he appeals to God on this basis. So I've picked out four things which we're going to look at briefly. He appeals to God, number one, on the basis of adoption. Number two, on the basis of grace. Number three, on the basis of God's character. And number four, on the basis of his promises. So firstly, let's look at this. The first one, he, he reminds God about it was God's choice to adopt his people into a family relationship. So he starts off by saying, Lord, why should your anger burn against your people? Not just this rabble, this crowd, your people. Do not bring disaster on your people. Right? He's, he's looking at who they are. The people haven't understood this. Moses has understood it very well. God, these are your people whom you have chosen, whom you have rescued, whom you have loved. And there's, there's quite a few places through the Old Testament before we even get to the New, where it talks about uh, God, wants, God adopting the people of Israel. So, for example, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 says, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now, that's applied to Jesus as well in the New Testament. But this was God's heart. It could have been, oh gosh, look at this rabble. No, no. Who are this rabble? We could look at ourselves sometimes, couldn't we? Who are we? Oh, yes, we are the people of God. Did we decide to be the people of God? Uh, no. No, God decided to call us yeah. the people of God. I don't want to argue with God. I don't feel like I'm a child of God sometimes. But if God says I am, I am. And another verse from Deuteronomy, which is again quoted in the New Testament, so a verse from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 8.5, says, As a man disciplines his son, so the Lord disciplines you. And, and we could look at so many things in the New Testament about where we see the fullness uh, of this love. So, for example, 1 John 3.1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. And, and you might think that might go on to say, well, he's done this, and he's given me that. Actually, what is this love that he's lavished? It is, it is supremely expressed in that we should be called children of God. Yeah. Now, we love the things that God does. We love the things that he, he gives to us. But the, the essence, the heart of, of the lavish love of God is that you are adopted into his family. He has chosen you. You know well the verses in John 15. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And uh, I heard somebody say once that in um, our experience of God, we could have something uh, that he, he used this lovely phrase, spiritual malabsorption. What do I mean by that? Okay, now, Helen used to um, have gluten intolerance. So she couldn't eat anything with wheat, you know, pasta, bread, uh, all, all that sort of stuff. She's been completely healed of that by God now, miraculously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But what happened in, that, in, in the period when we didn't realise what was happening, which was, I don't know, maybe 18 months or something like that, she did eat and eat and eat and eat, but lost weight. <laughs> and it didn't make sense. And what was happening was there was something wrong with her body. So... The, the goodness was coming into her body, but her body wasn't able to like, hold on to it, if you like. It wasn't doing her any good. That's what it means by malabsorption, bad absorption. And actually, can't we be like that spiritually? Right? We can hear, you, you can quote Bible verses, not just hear them. But actually, when the pressure is on, that tells us 
whether that knowledge, that truth is really got into our heart. All right, so we can know it, but not really know it. Now, now, the heart of God, of course, is not just to tell us off that, but say, no, come on, let me help you to really take these things on board into, into your heart. So we need to have the correct interpretation of challenging circumstances. We need to have a spirit of adoption, a spirit of sonship, not an orphan spirit. Let me give you an example from uh, our connections with Zambia. Our church has had uh, connections there for 15 years or more. Uh, we've been out there loads of times, wonderful privilege, and uh, lots of people in our church sponsor a child out there. Um, some of the children who we first knew when they were around 10 years old, you know, they're now 25 years old, uh, young adults, and uh, they're still in contact with us and, and other people in the church. Let, let me give you two examples. There's an amazing guy called Modern, um, who is a, a sprinter. Uh, he's in the Zambian national team. He's 0.9 of a second away from um, qualifying time for the 100 metres for the Olympics. So we pray the next Olympics, he's going to be there. Okay. Now he's got an athletics coach, of course. And uh, coaches uh, encourage and they inspire, but they sometimes have to say some hard stuff. And uh, I remember sometime him complaining to me, oh, my coach is against me. He doesn't like me. You know, those, those sort of words. And, uh, and, and I wrote back and I said to him, no, no, your coach is for you, but you're interpreting what he's saying in the wrong way. He, absolutely, he, he is for you. But he's saying some hard things that you don't like. He's saying some things which are hard to digest, shall we say, hard to respond to. And so do you, can you see the parallel of what, what was happening with the people of God? Uh, they interpreted the circumstances, they interpreted what God was doing in the wrong way. Therefore, they came to the wrong conclusion about God. And we can do the same. We can think God has forgotten us. And of course, the enemy gets on the back of that. Yeah, he doesn't like you. <laughs> he's, you're, you're so bad, he's rejecting you. We can, we can interpret things in the wrong way. And, and I had a very similar thing just last week. Another one of these lads who's, who's 25 or so, um, he, he'd not done very well in his professional exams. He, he was doing, he realised that he hadn't studied enough. And uh, in message to himself, please forgive me, please forgive me, you know, don't reject me, you know. And, you know, and, and I can't remember what words I wrote back, but, but, but Sam, you know, we've known you for 15 years. You, you know, you, you know that you should have done things a bit differently, but we're not going to reject you. You know, so his identity, his status and value was for him wrapped up in how he performed. And he knew he hadn't performed very well, so he was very fearful of our response. But our response was a parent response. Okay, well, maybe we need to talk about how you do things differently, but you're secure. You're loved. Your identity, your status isn't based on your performance. And brothers and sisters, gosh, don't we need to learn that? Because everything in our education system is about achievement. And in a certain contexts, that's right. But you're not in God's education system. You're in God's family. <laughs> you know, when our kids misbehaved, <gasps> pastor's kids misbehaved, yes. <laughs> we didn't say, like, just get out of the house. You know, you're not my son. You're not my daughter. You might feel like doing that, but you can't do that. <laughs> They're your kids. So let me tell you, you are God's kids. Yeah. You're his children. And everything that he does is out of a good heart. Every way that he treats you is because he loves you and he wants the best for you. The things we like and the things that we don't like so much. So, so Moses appeals to God on the basis of adoption. God, don't do this. These are your people. And in our prayers and our responses, this is the first thing that we need to do. When we come before God and say, Lord, I'm your son, I'm your daughter, you are my father, and, and ask the Holy Spirit to, to grow our understanding of the Father's heart for us, especially in those difficult moments. Okay, so the, so the first basis, Moses' appeal was adoption. The second one is grace. So he says, your people 
whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. So Moses reminds God, but actually it's us who need the reminding. You know, we, we quickly forget the incredible things that, that God has done. Let me give you a couple of verses from Romans to remind us of this. Romans 5. If while we were enemies, in other words, before you knew God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Okay, you know, in your darkest moments, remember that in even darker moments, God saved you. Jesus died for you when you never deserved it, and you never will deserve it. <laughs> he gave his all when you were his enemies. Gosh, that, that's, I would not like to be opposed to God. <laughs> that's a scary place to be. In that time when, from God's perspective, you were opposing him, mm. the way you were thinking, the way you were living, in that worst, darkest moment, God saved you. So don't let your the weakness in your thinking or emotions, don't let the enemy lie to you and say, well, you're outside again now, trying to get back in. No, if God saved you in your worst moment, how much more is he going to love you now? And in Romans 8, it says, God who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things, all things. So in your moments of trial, in your moments of pressure, in your moments of, pressure, of, of um, difficulty and failure, remind yourself, no God, thank you, you have still saved me. Nothing can change that, nothing will ever change that. I'm still the one that you have loved and that you, you have saved. Then the third thing that Moses brings to God in his appeal, this is really, really getting to the, the core of it. He looks at God's character and God's heart. He, remember, he doesn't look at the people. You know, it's, if, it's just a mess if he looks at the people. He looks at who God is, what God's mind is, what God's character is, what God's heart is. So he says, so why should the Egyptians, in other words, you know, the people around them who are watching what's happening, why should the Egyptians say, oh, yeah, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them. In other words, he's saying to God, God, if you get rid of your people now, all these other ungodly nations would say, yeah, God's not really good, is he? Yeah, he was tricking you. You thought he was saving you, but actually he's brought you out into the wilderness to kill you. And actually, of course, the people <laughs> at one point said those words themselves to Moses. So... Really, it's black and white, yes or no. Was God really on their side, even when they didn't understand it? Yes, he was on their side. But the question behind that, is God really good? Yes. You know there's only one possible answer to that. Yes. One answer. And, and, you know, when we go through, I'm, I'm not in any way wanting to minimise the hard things that we have in life. We don't understand a lot of things. We don't like a lot of things. But one thing that cannot change is that God is good. Yeah. Yes. And that's why, going back to Genesis 3 again with the temptation, why uh, the first lie by the serpent was, God isn't as good as you think he is. Because he said to uh, Adam and Eve, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the answer is no, he didn't say that. You must not eat from any tree. God's, God's actually a bit of a spawn sport. Kind of sort of this garden full of fruit, all these nice things, and you're not allowed to touch any of it. That is not what God said. Right. <laughs> God said you can have anything you like, apart from that one tree that won't do you any good. So the lie of the enemy was basically, God isn't good. God doesn't like you. God doesn't want to prosper you. He doesn't want you to enjoy life. Actually, he's quite against you. He wants to hold you back. If you truly follow him, he's going he's to restrict you. And, it, and so it, failure in trials in those difficult moments brings out what we really think 
difficulty so mm. I can and I think back to when the Lord called us from Bolt, uh, from the south up to Bolton uh, God spoke really really clearly I haven't got time to tell all, all the story um, so, so God spoke really clearly and I, I did envisage it would be like the Red Sea just parting and everything would fall into place and you might guess it wasn't actually like that uh, things went downhill it got very very difficult for month after month uh, and and I was shocked that having been a Christian quite a long time by that point and being in church leadership and everything, that I found myself even thinking, oh, God's, God's punishing me because I've done something wrong. No, what, what, what is it? And, and then I thought, oh, no, no, Lord, help me, please. Help me. You know, Lord, this is, this is showing up something inside me that I didn't realise was there. So this is actually is part of the reason why God allows us to go through tricky things because it, it brings out the stuff inside us that we need to offer to him and to be replaced with, with, with something good. So is God really good? Yes. And Moses appeals to God and we can appeal to God on that basis. God, because you're good, I know you will help me in this. I know you will provide for me. I know you will guide me. I know you will set me free, whatever it is that we need, because you are good, Lord. Therefore, you can't help but love me. You can't help but help me in this situation. And, and so it, it's really important to see that God's character isn't just a kind of statement of faith. It's an expression of his heart. It's not something impersonal that we just learn from a textbook. God feels love. Where do we get feelings from? We're created in the image of God. God feels for you. Remember, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Or the story in the Old Testament, when uh, the, the Moses saw the, the fire, the burning bush that didn't burn out, what did God say? I've, I've seen the struggles that my people are in, and I have compassion on them. I can't remember the exact words he spoke. God feels for you. He's, he's not a distant exam assessor. He's a father who feels. He's got, metaphorically speaking, a beating heart for you. He's protective of you. He's jealous of you in the right sense of the word. He, he wants you for himself. He wants you, you as corporately, you individually. He, when you go off to, after other stuff, when you get you know, other stuff to displace God, he's jealous. Yeah, we tend to understand jealousy in a bad way, and jealousy can be very bad. But the jealousy of God is an outworking of his love. He loves you that much that he's jealous for you. If you, if you thought about that, he loves you that much that he's jealous for you. And so when we talk about the, the character of God, we need to see that, that it's, uh, it, it's his heart for us. And we, there are times when we don't feel that love, we don't feel that heart, but it's still there. It's always there because he's always good. And then the fourth and final thing that uh, he, Moses appeals to God on is the basis of God's promises. God, remember. Now, God hadn't forgotten, remember. <laughs> he hadn't forgotten. But, but it was, Lord, you said this, so I'm going to take that as like ammunition for my prayers. You can be really confident taking promises of God. You know, you know they're from Scripture. You can be very, very confident <coughs> praying those things back to God. God, remember your servant Abraham, etc. You know, this is what you said. I'm going to give your descendants all this land. Very specific promise. I'm going to give them sense this land that, uh, that we're, we're going to go into. So God's character and God's heart overflow into his promises. And so I really urge you, whether it promises you can read in the word of God or maybe some specific promises that uh, you feel God has spoken to you, uh, you know, perhaps through reading the Bible or the Holy Spirit speaks to you or somebody else brings something prophetic to you, hold on to those promises. Treasure those promises. Don't just put them on the shelf and leave them there to gather dust. They are there for you to use. You know, we've got some very specific promises about our family. You know, there's, there's one or two difficult things that have been going on for a few years with, with our children. 
And uh, we, we've had some prophetic promises from different sources, and we, we are not just holding on to those, we are praying those back to God. God, we're looking forward to the day when you, said, when you do what you said you're going to do. And gosh, do we, do we need those things. Let us use them as ammunition for our, our prayers. And, and so note again, that just as we draw this bit to a, a close before we spend some time just listening to God and uh, receiving what he wants to do, that these four things I've talked about, adoption, grace, character, promises, they're all from God. They're all things that he said, that he's done, or that he is. And so how do we perceive ourselves when the pressure is on? Like the people of God didn't understand these things. That's why they did the wrong stuff and didn't do the right stuff. How do we perceive ourselves in moments of pressure? Is our identity and therefore our response defined by who we are? Also on a good day, I can feel very good about myself. <laughs> but is it, are you like a graph that goes up and down? Is your identity, is your value based on you? No, it doesn't need to be. It's based on God, who he is, his promises for you. Is your identity defined by your history? You know, you've, you've had some difficult things. Either difficult things that have happened to you, or been done to you, or difficult things that you've got yourself into. Is your future defined by what's happened before? It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. Let your future be defined only by who God is, what he's done for you, what he said, and what he's promised about you. So we need to pray uh, for wisdom, and we need to pray for revelation, so that uh, when we need to respond to something, when we decide what to do or not to do, that that is an overflow of how we perceive ourselves. I am a child of God. So, for example, a child of God does not need to go crawling back to God. Say, oh, accept me, accept me, please accept me. I know I've been bad. We never had our children do that. They needed to apologise <laughs> many times. We needed to apologise to them. But they didn't say, oh, please don't reject me, mum and dad. So why should we do that to God? God doesn't like that. It's, it's actually a slur on his character. He's a father. We're already chosen. We're already saved by grace. We already serve a God who is unchangeably good. And he has given us wonderful, great and precious promises. So know who you are. <coughs> Know who you are and let that define your confidence. Let that define uh, your, your future. Let's just pause and pray for a, a moment. Lord, we, we thank you so much, Lord God, that your, your word says that all the things written down in the scriptures are for our benefit, Lord so that we might see them, that we might learn from them, uh, that we might truly know who you are, Lord, by how you revealed yourself. And you know, as we come to you, say, Lord, that, that could have been us. That could have been me in the Garden of Eden. That could have been me in the wilderness. Uh, oh, God, thank you that just as you were gracious to your people, so you're gracious to us, Lord. And, and Lord, we, we pray for, I pray for like an alertness, Lord, that, when, that we would recognise when the lies and the accusations and the taunts of the enemy come in. Lord, help us to recognise, no, that is not the truth. That is counterfeit. Help us, Lord, to know the truth about who you are, Lord God. And, and Lord, when we do find ourselves thinking and feeling and responding in the wrong way. Again, Lord, please, in those moments, Lord, would you just gently point that out to us? Not to condemn us, Lord, but so that we might just give that to you and that you might teach us the true way to think, the true way to respond, 
our true identity, our true status, Lord. Lord, we need your help. But God, you saved us when we were enemies. How much more will you help us now, Lord? Because we're your kids. You're, you're disciplining us. You're bringing us to maturity, Lord God, full maturity. Oh, I thank you, God. And we, and we declare to one another, Lord, everything you do is for our good. Because you are good, Lord. Everything you do is for our good. That's what we hold on to, Lord. That's what we are believing. We thank you so much for it, Lord. And, and we thank you, Lord. Yeah, you are bringing us to maturity as precious, chosen children of God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. See you. I just, I just read a couple of things down to, I think, just sort of following on from what I've spoken that I thought there might, there might be some people in the room that you've, uh, at some point in your life, you've have had negative things spoken over you. It might be from a parent, even though that shouldn't happen, but it does. It might be from somebody else in an authority, a, a, a teacher who was had a downer on you or something. It could be somebody in the workplace. And, and because of that, I think you can, even though this is perhaps a subconscious response, you, you find it hard then to believe that God speaks good over you because you, you've had a, a negative thing from, from people in authority. Um, it, it's, it's really, put your hand up if you feel in any way you've, you've had any negative stuff spoken over you. Um, Okay, let's, let's, just, let's just hold that for a moment. We'll, we'll pray for people in a second. Thank you for, that is, there's no shame in admitting that. Right, we've all had difficult stuff done to us. Um, and then also I, I felt there's some people who've uh, really been, you, you've, you've swallowed the lie of the enemy where he's, like in the garden, he said, God, God's not really good. You've, you've, you've easily uh, doubted the goodness of God. You found it hard to get hold of that God is for me. Um, so it's not necessarily a particular thing you can point to what, why that has happened, but you just struggle to really take on board that, that God is as good as, as that. Is so any, anybody who that particularly applies to? Anybody wants to put a hand up for, for that one? Yeah. Yeah. This, it, yeah, Helen's got some stuff now as well. Yeah, I, I held a very strong picture actually earlier of um, uh, a stone, quite a large stone, but <clears throat> yeah, it was near a beautiful building, but the stone was remaining alone. And I, I just got a sense of um, maybe there's someone here or a few of us here who feel actually that we are like that stone, uh, dwelling alone, that we're very close to s some people, but we just feel that we don't really belong. And I think possibly it's, it is uh, quite possible to be in a church, but to feel alone, not to feel part, even though we're there, we're not there. Um, and I just felt the scripture to encourage you. Um, I, I think it's because you don't feel good enough. You, you feel like you're not good enough to belong. And I felt this scripture, uh, as you come to him, that's Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans. You know, Jesus knew rejection. He knew what it was to be alone. And I, 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 he wants you to know that, that he identifies with you. But you are cho he was chosen by God and precious to him. And you are chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. And that's your destiny, is to be built together with the people of God. And that's actually where you belong. And there's an invitation to leave that aloneness behind. That's a choice, actually. And you can choose to leave that behind and be part. I mean, emotionally part, not because you're there anyway, but you're not really being part. And there's an invitation this morning to leave that aloneness 
and be part. Because Jesus went through what he went through. So you didn't need to feel like that. But he identifies with you. He does understand. But he went through what he went through. So you could be part. Really part in every way. With the people of God. Oh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if anyone wants to put their hand up for that. I'm not, not really sure. <laughs> but, I would, <clears throat> but if you want to have prayer, you can ask for that whenever we do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll pray. Lord, thank you that, um, God, you're just amazing. Yeah. I, I just thank you that you, you just really know us and you love us so much. Lord, even, you know, like with all our stuff, you just love us. And, and there's, your heart is always calling out to our heart to draw near. Lord, you've made a way that we can draw near to you. We can experience your love. We've heard of your love, Lord, but we want to experience it more, Lord God. We want to lay aside our, our stuff, our problems, Lord. We want to say, yes, I'm in. I'm not, on, I'm, I'm not alone. I'm not rejected. I'm all in. I, I, I believe you I, when you, you know, even in the face of stuff that's shouting at me that God is not good, I, I choose to believe, Lord, you are good. Yes. And I'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experience your goodness, even in the midst of my trials. Yes. Yeah, thanks, God. Yeah, <laughs> it's real, isn't it? I've forgotten the first one. Um, and Lord, we, 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 we thank you, Lord, that you speak a better word over our lives, Lord God, than any word that any human has spoken over us, Lord God. And we just, we just bring those things to you right now, Lord God, and we, 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 we submit them to your feet, Lord God, and we, we, we again choose to lay them down. We say, hey, I'm not having that anymore. We break the power of words spoken over us in the name of Jesus. We cancel that assignment of the enemy that's got all in on the back of those lies. Uh, and as, uh, where those things have had an effect on us, where we have lived under those things. Lord God, we're going to come out from under those things because of the blood of Jesus. We're going to walk free this morning. We choose freedom. We're not going to rest under this bush of lies. <laughs> We're going to come out and we're going, to, we're going to dwell in freedom in the name of Jesus. Amen. In fact, I just had a little picture for those, those people who've uh, had negative stuff spoke, spoken of. The Lord, Lord says, I'm thinking about the, the Nerf gun war this afternoon, okay? The Lord has painted a target on you. Not a target to harm you, but, but a target to do you good. He's aiming for you. He's aiming for you. And he's going to get you. With his goodness, yes. all right. There's yes. <laughs> just a, a, a couple of individual things. I know Helen's got some as well. We want to encourage people. That the, the lady there in the black, you just yeah, got your hand up. To, yeah. As I got out of the car yesterday, I stole. All right. Just, just I just got out of the car and I went, look at this stone, and I was making everybody look at it. And it was by the front door of a beautiful building. Am I right? And it was in the shape of a heart. <laughs> so that was definitely a message from God. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I feel actually the Lord speaking to you something yeah. on, on those lines that if you, you probably wear things like diamonds, emeralds, you, you know, they're mined out of the ground, aren't they? And there's, there's loads of um, rubble and, and that you have, you have to search for them. And, and I just feel for the Lord saying that, that um, you know, there's been a lot of mud and a lot of dirt. Uh, in your background, but God has searched for you and yes, found yes. you, and yes. you're a precious jewel. Yes. And and you know when you first get um, uh, a gemstone out of the ground, you know you don't just have to like clean it off of, of the dirt, mm -hmm. but you know it's polished and it's and it's sort of shaped. It was, and, it was. That's right. And, and so so he's saying that you you're a precious jewel, and yes. he's shaping you to get. To make the most of you. Well, I was baptised last Sunday. Fantastic. So I saw it as um, yeah. welcome. Um, yes. First year here, first year uh, in the excellent. church. Excellent. So, you know, just as a jeweller, <coughs> like, shapes a gemstone so you've got, like, the different facets of it and it and it reflects the light really beautifully. That's what God's doing in your life. He actually Amen. wants to put you on display Amen. for other people. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well done. Um, 
it's two, you two lads over here. Um, are, are you brothers, you two? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I feel the Lord is saying, well, let me just explain a little, little bit. I don't know if this works this way in other countries, but in our country, when there's been a time of war, like the Second World War, that people who were civilians, they'd get a letter through the post or something like that, and they'd call it, that's their call-up papers. You're called up to, to join the, the army. And, uh, and I feel the Lord is saying to, to you two guys, the Lord is calling you up. Yeah. He's calling you up. Yeah. Now, there's some differences from that illustration, okay? Because, you know, you're not going to die. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when Jesus calls you up to things, it's, it, it's good things. And, you know, in the army, you don't have a choice. But actually, God is speaking to you seriously, but he's, a, he's appealing to you from his heart. He's not saying you've got to. He's saying to you, both of you, I really want you. I really want you. And there's a letter with your individual names on. It's not addressed. I don't know if you're, I assume your parents are here somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they're not. No, just here. But, but uh, you know, particularly, I don't know if you've been brought up in a Christian home, but sometimes we can feel, oh, that's just for my mum and dad. No, this has got your name on. Yeah. Jesus yeah. Call, is calling you. And when we're, when we're civilians, we can sort of, if you like, do what we like, when, when we like. Um, but when you're called up to something, you don't have those same choices anymore. And, but when it's God who's your commanding officer, it's a good thing. And yeah. we have to change again the way that we, we, we think. And he's, he's calling you maybe to change some stuff in your life. It's not perhaps intrinsically wrong, but he's calling you something better. Yeah. He's calling you yeah. something further, something, something different. And, and he's, he's appealing to you to read the letter, read what he's saying to you because and it's because he's got stuff for you to do right there's things that he's he's, that he's, he's got your name on that hasn't got anybody else's name there's people that you're going to meet there's places where you're going to go in your your life you know might not be next week might be a few years time where only you can do that and only you will know those people but he, but the main thing is he's he's calling you he's calling you up okay <laughs> Highlighted to me during the worship a lot. I, I really got the sense that the Lord was standing, standing next to you and with His arm around you. And I, I feel like He wants to encourage you that He's really close to you and He really delights in you and He really affirms you. He sees you and He hears you, and and He really cares about you. And uh, I felt the scripture, um, and I feel like this is what He has done and is doing. Uh, he brought me out into a spacious place. This is Psalms 18, verse 19. He brought me out into a spacious place where you've been confined and constricted. Um, he rescued me because he delighted in me. And I feel like the Lord really wants to highlight that he delights in you. That he, that he just delights in you. You don't have to do anything. He is with you and he loves you very much. So I just wanted to... Just bring that encouragement for you. Uh, and then, um, now I know I should know your names, and I, I, I've forgotten them. Uh, the lovely couple that I met at the regional meeting. Uh, uh, yeah, Jeff and Libby. Yes, I should know that, shouldn't I? Jeff and Libby. Um, so sorry. Um, yeah, I, I have this picture for you. I saw like a, a trail of. Um, I want to say like breadcrumbs. <laughs> um, and I saw you, uh, I feel like through your life you followed the Lord diligently, like you followed the trail of breadcrumbs. You, you said yes to him, and I know you've traveled, so I, I know you've been abroad. So you said yes to him, and you followed, uh, and, and I feel the commendation of the Lord for you. But I also feel like um, he's led you, he has actually specifically led you back here, and you know that. But I feel like um, it, it's it's not um, you've not come back to get old. You've come back. To, there's there's more for you to do. You've not come back to rest and get old. 
And I, I actually feel like because the, because you've said yes to him and you followed diligently the trail, uh, that he is trusting you to. I saw you actually laying a trail for other people. Um, I saw you. Um, uh, Christians and people that don't yet know Jesus particularly. Actually, I saw you almost laughing between the two of you and say, oh, now what's the next step for them? And you actually say, oh yeah, we'll do that then. You know, whether that's, I don't know, an invitation to that particular person around for coffee or something. And just, I saw you giggling together actually. Let's see what God's gonna do next. We're, and just let, and because God can trust you to lay a trail because you know it's not about you. So you're laying a trail for other people to find Jesus. That's what I felt that he was, he's got for you. So bless you. Hope that encourages you. Um, and, and this Levi lady, what's your name? Ifama. Ifama. I've got a friend called Ifama at home. Uh, she's a great lady. So I, I felt like you, um, I saw you. Um, I saw you before the Lord, and I feel like you're an adventurer and in the spirit. So I felt like you um, were being called to in deeper to prayer. I saw you um, praying in the spirit. I saw the Lord giving you a sword, and you were making some very bold, adventurous declarations. <laughs> before you were making some very bold declarations before Him, but the Lord said, "I'm going to back up." what you say. Yes. So uh, I feel like you'll be found more in the prayer closet. Amen. I think it'd be great to um, <laughs> I think it'd be great to pray for so each of those people who've had words from one or others just now could you just put your hand up again for a, a moment. Uh, is Lance? Lance over here as well. Okay, so if you could, could you get up out of your seat if you're easily near, so that everybody's got praying, somebody praying for them, please. So, okay. So the two ladies over here need somebody praying for them. Okay, so pray to, please pray, just spend a few minutes. Just praying to bless those people. If you can, hopefully you can remember roughly what was, was said about them. So pray, pray those things into being. Pray for a great, great blessing. We'll just spend a few minutes doing that in small groups like this.
Okay, we're just going to do one more thing together, but if you want to lead or want to finish off some individual prayer, then please, please continue with that. Um, so what, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to get us all to, uh, to declare some truths about ourselves. Uh, okay, so, um, so you guys from an African background, you'll be really familiar with this. Um, if you're from a white British background, you're not so familiar, but we need, need to be. Okay, so for example, in the Bible it says, let the weak say, I am strong. Yes. Okay, so there's power in words. When God spoke the word, the world came into being. So there's a power in, in declaration. And um, I, I say these nearly every day over myself. Okay, now you can make up your own declarations from the Bible. I hope you understand that bit. <laughs> Ones that particularly apply to you, but I've got them under three headings. Who I am, where I am, and whose I am. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna, there's two for each thing, and I, I'm going to say something, and then I'd like you to uh, repeat it uh, as if you mean it. Okay, because it's true. Right, so firstly under the heading of who I am. So say after me, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. I count myself dead to sin. I count myself dead to sin. But alive to God in Christ Jesus. Excellent. Okay, so the second one is where I am. So I am seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. I am seated in the heavenly realms. I am a citizen of heaven. I am a citizen of heaven. Well, thirdly, whose I am. In other words, who do I belong to? I am not my own. I am not my own. I was bought at a price. I was bought at a price. I walk by the Spirit. I walk by the Spirit. I do not do whatever I want. I do not do whatever I want. Hallelujah. Well done. I really encourage you, particularly in, in areas where you know you know you have struggled. So, for example, I, I used to get quite fearful about whether God would provide for me. So I made sure I learned off by heart Bible verses which talk about God providing, about God being a father. I even learned them in more than one language so that I didn't get too familiar for it <laughs> with, with it rather. So I encourage you, you know, you, you know yourself. So, so pick Bible verses which speak into uh, what is currently your weakness so God can turn those weaknesses into strength. And don't do them once in a blue moon, once in a while. All right? Do them regularly. And what I did for probably six months, I didn't just read these out. Blah, 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 blah. Right? I, I felt really daft doing this, but I, I stood in front of the mirror and I eyeballed myself and spoke them to myself. And it was really powerful, yes. okay, because it's the living and the active Word of God. So, okay, so you, thank you so much. We're, we're, we're finishing here.